by uh, Anthony Cordesman, who, who writes on, on uh, nuclear security issues, had a, had a quotation along the lines of, uh, there, there is one country in the Middle East that stands under an existential threat. It is Iran, yes. the threat from Israeli nuclear weapons. Uh, one wishes one would hear that a little more often. I mean, Iran is a country that has no big brother like the United States standing behind it. It's a country that has uh, a couple hundred thousand U.S. combat troops on its eastern border and on its western border, uh, and, uh, and it is under sanctions from the entire world. Our trick now is to convince the Iranians they do not need nuclear weapons to protect themselves. Uh, and I, my, it's my personal view that, that saying, well, we're going to have to attack Iran by the end of the year is not a way to convince nuclear weapons, that it, uh, convince Iran that it should not develop nuclear weapons. The, the people who, who uh, understand Iran far better than I do describe their clerical government as perhaps odious but pragmatic. And uh, they are not suicidal. They are not, they're not going to do something like that. And fortunately, the state of nuclear forensics these days indicates that if something like that occurred, in a not too long period of time, we would know where that fissile material came from. And the US has already announced that we, we would hold the country responsible for, provided the, for providing the weapon. There's no way, in my mind, that, that Iran would ever give a nuclear device to Hezbollah or Hamas, uh, even though it has very close relations with Hezbollah, but that would, that would be reckless and, uh, and suicidal for Iran to do that, so I don't expect that to happen at all. Uh, Iran is not Nazi Germany. I mean, they do not have the Nazis' genocidal attitude about Jews. Jews in Iran live not the way they do in the United States, but in a better circumstances than they do in many Arab countries, that, that some of which are very friendly in the United States. So that's the first point of view about be careful about overstating Iran's belligerence toward Israel. The other part of it is, of course, uh, Ahmadinejad would never have his hands on the nuclear trigger. It would be Khamenei, the supreme leader. And this is, this is constantly and deliberately confused in the American public because Ahmadinejad is the perfect guy to hate. And I saw the, the head of the Missile Defense Agency uh, the previous one, arguing that we need to spend a lot more money on strategic missile defense against Iran. And all of a sudden, on this sort of scientific uh, slideshow about U.S. missiles, boom, there's Ahmadinejad's face. I mean, he's a, he's a wonderful seller of, of strategic missile defenses. I do, I do not, I, but, but if you want examples of Iranian pragmatism, let's, let's look at, for example, their agreement with the United States and the rest of the international community in late 2001 to come up with a solution to the new Afghanistan government. Jim Dobbins, who was our negotiator in it, said the key player in these negotiations, the one that made it work, was the Iranian government. And that Iran was cooperating with the United States on counterterrorism, cooperating with the United States government on al-Qaeda, until roughly the time that, that, that George W. Bush said that we are facing an axis of evil, including North Korea and Iraq and Iran. That's the thanks that Iran got for constructive help on Afghanistan and with Al Qaeda, I mean, and Iran for the Iranians, um, they have a, a burning memory about the U.S. help in overthrowing their democratic government in 1953. I mean, some of them even remember when we shot down one of their civilian airliners, killing over 200 men, women, and children. So, this government, which has a very radical uh, <coughs> clerical ideology and talks about the return of the 12th Imam, and does not act like that. In, in, my, in my opinion, they are, a, they are a, 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 a not very democratic, repressive, obnoxious government that plays by the rules of international states in many areas. That doesn't mean that they're not violating the agreements that you cited in, in aiding Hezbollah. And in fact, they do aid Hezbollah, which we classify as a terrorist organization, which is why we classify the Iranian government as a terrorist organization. But I would say that uh, I still trust, the, and I've, I've read quite a bit about this and talked to a lot of Iranian Americans, I believe the characterizations that Iran is uh, a pragmatic, hard-nosed government. And we can make a deal with that kind of government. My, My current focus at the Arms Control Association concerns making realistic threat assessments. And my interest in this subject was spurred, no doubt, by my past experiences in the State Department's Intelligence Bureau trying to assess realistically the threat posed by Saddam Hussein. Test monitoring technology is getting even better. The treaty provides for monitoring stations inside Russia, China, 
and at other sensitive locations, including places where the U.S. could otherwise not gain access. North Korea's nuclear tests in 1996, and sorry, in 2006 and 2009, demonstrated that the CTBT verification system is working well and can detect even very small explosions. Without the ability to conduct nuclear weapons test explosions, countries cannot proof test new warhead designs and build more capable arsenals. And this means, for example, that China will have difficulty designing multiple warheads for its new mobile missiles, and that Iran would have much greater difficulty trying to design and integrate a warhead into its existing medium-range missiles. U.S. ratification of the CTBT would reinforce the taboo against testing and create pressures for others, such as China, India, and Pakistan, to ratify the treaty. Our newspaper headlines are full of stories about North Korea and Iran, even though they are not part of the nuclear missile threat to the United States homeland. If current trends continue and worst-case political assumptions are played out, these countries may indeed be able to deploy a few missiles with nuclear warheads by the end of the decade, but if this were to happen, neither country would be able to put the U.S. deterrent at risk. Furthermore, the small number of Iranian and North Korean long-range missile launchers would themselves be extremely vulnerable to attack, whether by nuclear or conventional means. These third country contingencies should therefore have no appreciable impact on the required size of the U.S. nuclear arsenal. For the purposes of implementing the nuclear posture review, the high impact comes principally from Russia, and only secondarily from China. The North Korean and Iranian threats are relatively low impact. Overstating the significance of the threats from the latter two states runs the risk of providing further impetus for their governments to seek nuclear weapons as tokens of prestige and power and as a means of leveraging concessions from the international community. It also encourages rash military action on the part of the United States or its allies. And one sees that almost daily in terms of the Israeli government's statements about the necessity of attacking Iran uh, if Iran does not give up its nuclear enrichment capability. Um, what do you know about a very powerful group that is situated at 45 Rockefeller Plaza united against nuclear Iran and they're increasingly um, just explosive propaganda against Iran? I, uh, they are fairly objective in describing newspaper articles, but when they take a position on things, uh, I find it not to my liking. I find that they are not objective on Iran. And I'm, I'm disturbed to see the, the people like, I think, Richard Holbrook, who was a member of their, their founding organization, who should know better. And I, I'm disappointed to see some people on that list that I would not expect. So I do not, have, I do not hold that organization in high regard. In order for the treaty ultimately to go into effect, certain states have to ratify it, and those states include Israel. So we've got to get Israel eventually to ratify it, and North Korea, before the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty enters full force. Um, so it does, it does enter in that way. Um, but in terms of our non-proliferation objectives in the Middle East and elsewhere, we are perceived as being hypocritical because we act, I mean, you can even hear American politicians say, we've got to make sure that nuclear weapons are not introduced into the Middle East. I mean, this makes the jaws drop, you know, from Cairo to, to uh, I don't know where, to Pakistan. Um, but you, you see this all the time. We're completely blind to it. Yes, the Israeli government doesn't admit that they have nuclear weapons, and they don't deny that they have nuclear weapons, uh, but they have nuclear weapons. And, uh, and they have more nuclear weapons uh, than North Korea. They have more nuclear weapons uh, probably than Pakistan. And, uh, and that's a lot. I mean, we're getting to the point where they may have more nuclear weapons than Britain. <laughs> so um, it's something that needs to be dealt with. If we can have success with the CTBT, that will put pressure on Israel to, to uh, take action itself. And there are some things that they can do, including more transparency. And I would even argue Israel can also sign the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. I don't think Israel has any plans for, for nuclear testing. So they, they should, we should be able to convince Israel, at least before we convince North Korea.